This video is sponsored by Cycle Central Coast, the ultimate resource for cyclists to find the best rides and best food in California's beautiful Central Coast. Dropper Post Fat Meats, is this the gravel plus plus slash bikepacking bike of your dreams? Find out in this video. Welcome back Pathless Peddlers. And if you're new to the channel, we're all about the non-competitive side of cycling, riding party pace. And if that sounds good to you, hit that subscribe button. In this video, I'm going to be reviewing the Kona Sutra ULTD, which is the burlier slacker uh, version of the Kona Sutra, which is their venerable touring platform. Starting off with the frame and fork, it is made out of Kermali steel and it's got this beautiful, what they're calling a prism colored paint job. Sometimes it's purple, sometimes Sometimes it's rust, it constantly changes depending on the light. Not only is it rugged and capable, it's a pretty good looker. The bike is built around the 29er wheel size and it's rocking these Maxxis Recon Race uh, 29 by 2.25 inch tires. The tread on the tires aren't super aggressive, so they worked well here in the semi-arid uh, climate of Montana. The bike is thoroughly modern. It's got through axles as well as hydraulic disc brakes. Moving up to the fork, it has a standard three pack mount that you would expect from a bike packing specific bike. The controls are SRAM rival. It's set up one by 11 speeds and they're mounted to a pretty general generously wide handlebar for the size. I should mention this is the size 50. The handlebars are 46 centimeters on a size 50 frame. Typically you wouldn't see this in a road bike or some gravel bikes, but it's nice to have a wider bar to get that extra leverage on a bike like this. You'll notice it's also rocking a really short stem, so definitely more mountain bike inspired in the front end. Moving to the rest of the frame, it's got adventure nipples galore. It's got mounting points here, so you could run a custom frame bag with direct mounts instead of Velcro to the top tube. Two other areas for bottle cages, as well as space for a bottle cage on the down tube. The crank is a 36 tooth SRAM NX crank. And in the rear, we've got an 11 to 42 cassette in 11 speeds running through a SRAM rival derailleur. The rear is also well equipped with eyelets for a rear rack. You'll notice I am using a Thule pack and pedal, which is designed to work without eyelets. Don't let that confuse you. It does have eyelets. You can put any standard rack on there. Probably one of the coolest pieces of kit on this bike is actually the dropper post. It's this dropper post by Trans X. And what makes it unique is that you can actually set hard stops to how much travel the dropper post will have. And you can do this all without tools. You just have to have the dropper post fully extended. Then you unscrew the top cap and then you move the shim over to determine the amount of travel you want for the dropper post. This is probably less important for taller riders that have more flexibility in setting their seat post. But if you tend to be a shorter rider, then you know that usually when the dropper post is fully uh, extended, sometimes you have to jam it all the way down into the frame. This gives you more flexibility in fine tuning how much the saddle pops up. I know what you're thinking, this is a pretty dreamy ride. You know what else is dreamy? The sponsor of today's video, CycleCentralCoast.com. Cycle Central Coast is the ultimate guide to one of our favorite places to ride California's Central Coast, spanning San Simeon to Avila Beach. CycleCentralCoast.com has both paved and gravel routes from epic all day leg busters to more casual day rides. It also has resources on places to stay so you can plan that ultimate cycling holiday. The Central Coast is also host to Eroica, California, an event ride that takes you through some absolutely stunning scenery. My friends, this is a place your bike dreams about. So to learn more, visit CycleCentralCoast.com, follow them on Instagram, and if you want to see their recommended routes, they actually have a Strava club. So join them on Strava as well. So with my time with the ULTD, uh, I took it on the gravel loops that I do here in the area, as well as some single track. Unfortunately, didn't get an opportunity to fully load it and go on a overnighter or anything. It's been too smoky, too many wildfires, and that's just 2021. Overall handling, the bike feels very stable. It's got a longish chainstay at 445. And in the front end, it's got a 69.5 head tube angle paired with a 55 millimeter offset. And with these tires, the resultant trail is about 79. So in the spectrum of things, it is definitely a lot higher trail than your typical endurance road bike, kind of creeping into mountain bike territory, but not quite. And how this translates to handling is uh, the bike generally wanted to go straight. 
It was pretty easy to maintain a straight line when going on some chunky gravel, the occasional baby head. Crossing over the rocky middle on some double track proved no problem, it would just sail right through. On flat and level terrain, it pretty much steered itself, took very little input. This is a great quality for a bike to have on a long day on the saddle when you don't want to micromanage the steering. Going uphill on a slow climb, you kind of saw those effects of a higher trail bike. It would wander a little bit, get, get a little drunken goatee, have some wheel flop, Definitely not the most wheel flop I've ever experienced on a bike. I think for the most part, it's mitigated by the wider handlebar and the shorter stem. It's there, but it's not overly distracting and you can adapt. I think where the bike really shines is going downhill. This is a big wheel and some big tires for me. I usually ride 650B by 50. And I could definitely feel the difference in the larger wheel size and fatter meets. It rolled over more chunky stuff where on my 650Bs it would give me more pause. And overall a pretty composed descender on gravel roads. I did take it on some single track and I think it performed better than some cross inspired gravel bikes that I've ridden for sure. However, not not a full-on substitute for a mountain bike in those conditions. And one reason for me is the handlebars. I actually would have preferred a shallower drop handlebar. And what I mean by this is if I'm riding mostly gravel roads, I'll set it up so that the hoods are my primary position. But if I do hit trails, I do want to be in the drops for a little bit more control and stability. And for me, the drops feel a little bit too deep. And if I were going to hit a lot of single track, I'd probably want to raise the bars up. But I think if they had a shallower drop, you could kind of split the compromise a little bit better. So what are the likes and the dislikes? One big like is the geometry. I think it's well suited for the terrain it was intended. Although it has drop bars, it definitely leans towards the mountain biking end of the spectrum rather than the road and cross end of the spectrum. Makes total sense for a bike packing application. You don't want something super twitchy when you're descending some really gnarly stuff with a load. Another big like is actually the dropper post. I wish more dropper posts were like this. I love the fact that you can adjust it without tools and you can really dial in the travel uh, to get that ideal seat position. I think this makes a great exploratory bike where you're going out on a gravel ride or testing out a new route, which may have some trail, which may have some chunk. You're not quite sure what to expect this bike would handle it. In terms of dislikes, the bike does feel a little bit on the chonky side. As you see it with pedals and a cage and a size 50 centimeter frame, minus the Thule uh, rack, it comes in at 28 and a half pounds. So not a featherweight and you feel that when you're going up the steep stuff. And that kind of leads me to the next dislike here and it's the gearing. I think because of its kind of heavier starting base weight, once you put a load on it, and if you climb in the mountains, it's going to be inadequately geared. I would have liked to see some kind of mullet setup, maybe at least a 46, maybe a 48, if not a 50 back there. You can definitely change the front chain ring from a 36 to something like a 32 and keep it with the 11 to 42, but you lose your top end. So I would have much preferred seeing like either a 46 or a 50 in the back. And I get it, Kona is probably constrained by uh, what's available. Uh, what SRAM is offering and what they allow to be on a OEM build. But as you guys know, I'm a fan of the budget mullet and this bike uh, would definitely be a candidate for a budget mullet setup. So either hacking the rival rear derailleur with a Garbrook extender cage, something like this, or getting an Eagle derailleur and putting a ratio cable fin in there so you can run an 11 to 50 in the back. Other than that, those are my two biggest complaints. Overall, it was a super fun bike to ride. That's definitely a great bike for exploring the gravel back roads here in Montana. I'm not the greatest descender and the big wheels and big tires and front end geometry really compensated for my skittishness. So I definitely loved that about the bike. I did feel it was a little draggy. Again, that could be changed with either lower gearing or going baller on the wheels. I know some of you are gonna be wondering how does this compare to the Salsa Cutthroat? So I'm gonna address that, but I will say that the last Cutthroat I rode was a 2018 and that was before a pretty uh, significant geometry upgrade. I rode a size medium cutthroat and I believe they shipped with a 90 millimeter stem, maybe an 80, but definitely longer than uh, this stubby guy that they have here on the Kona. They had similar tire sizes. Uh, the trail was pretty similar. I think the cutthroat was in the low 80s. It exhibited kind of the same qualities. It wanted to stay straight, held its line really well, wouldn't get deflected on small rock. Was a little floopy floppy on the climbs, especially with a load and generally lean stable, just like the ULTD. The biggest difference of course, is that the cutthroat was carbon and this is steel. But in big broad strokes, the handling characteristics were very similar. They were both leaning towards that 
stable mountain biking geometry. So in some ways, if you've always wanted a alloy cutthroat because you know, you're paranoid like me about carbon, then the ULTD would actually make a good choice. So what do you guys think of the ULTD? Is this the bike packing or gravel bike plus of your dreams? Let me know in the comments below. If you have any other questions, leave those in the comments. I'll be sure to check them out and definitely check out the sponsor for today's video, Cycle Central Coast, and find the next dream ride of your dreams. Does that make sense? That's good content. As always, keep the supple side down.